Be a doll, give it all. 15 years later, we are recognized by President Barack Obama. Um, we have some of the biggest names in the world, like Danny Washington, to hey. support us. Um, Misty Copeland, Tay Diggs, and, and just everyday Black women who want to change the world. So people think, you know, how do you do that? You empower. And we have empowered our women from, you know, getting up in the morning and saying, I'm changing my life. I'm tired of being in this way. And I'm going to leave that man. Or I'm tired of just spending so much money and not being philanthropic. So I'm going to get up and feed the homeless. Um, we do all types of things. And so every Christmas to go back to what we've always done on the first Saturday of every December at one o'clock PM around this great country, Black women put on their black doll t-shirts. Our slogan is no membership fee, just buy your black doll tee. We put on our black doll t-shirts, we come to life and we give away dolls. So we are the largest consumer group of toy black dolls because of that. And um, in the middle of the night, um, just you know, doing what people do when they can't sleep, I was on the internet and I came across your page and was just, you know, oh, she's pretty. Look at her, oh, a mocha mermaid, I love it. <laughs> and then I realized that this pretty little face matched our slogan, which is, uh, we have so many, but one of them is pretty philanthropic. Mm -hmm. And I realized that you weren't just being pretty, you were, you were swimming for a cause. And the more I clicked, the more that I saw, the more that I learned. And the biggest thing that disturbed me was something I didn't know. And that is that our black communities are the chosen dumping grounds for pollution. Yes. And then you taught me all about plastic pollution. So here we are. Um, every year I choose a theme for the black dolls to get behind to do what we set out to do, and that's to change the world. So I've chosen you as an honorary doll to lift your voice and teach us how to swim through this pollution, how to make the world a better place before we go on to our next mission next year. Who knows what that will be? But um, I'm, I'm learning so much and I look forward to, to having you teach me more. So with that, Danny, what do we need to know? Oh, there's so much, there's so much. I mean, you know, obviously dealing with COVID and everything that we've gone through the last 12 months as a global community has shaken a lot of things up. And I think it's woken a lot of people up as well to especially um, environmental issues. And so when we look at our waste, the things that we're consuming on a daily basis, we're seeing that this waste is ending up uh, not away. Like we like to say, we're throwing something away. It ends up somewhere. And that somewhere usually tends to be in a landfill or in our waterways and eventually into our ocean. But a lot of these landfills are placed right on the borderline of BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, people of color living right next door to these places um, that are spewing out toxic fumes and different things that they're breathing into their lungs, contaminating water. And so as consumers, as people who are buying things, things like dolls, we have to think about this cradle to cradle model. Like when you buy something, what happens to it after you're done with it? And what are the materials that are part of that product? And so when it comes to toys specifically, majority of toys made today are made from plastic. And plastic comes from crude oil in the ground that's extracted, pulled up, refined, and then turned into all these different products, whether it's gasoline that we put in our cars or plastic products that we use on a daily basis. Um, but what we're finding now and what scientists are finding out is that a lot of the, the chemicals used to make these plastics feel different. So like the soft, squishy plastics that we see in toys, they're adding things called phthalates and other additives plasticizers that allow that plastic to feel the way that it does. But those specific like chemicals are causing cancer and other sicknesses within our own bodies. And so it's about, again, reframing how we buy things, thinking, what do we, what do we need? What do we need on a daily basis? Ask yourself that question. And it's especially important when we think about what we're giving to our babies and our kids to play as, with. As they as play with, not only just play with, chew on. Chew on, yes, exactly. Put in their mouths, all best. Yes, so we, we, I think a lot of people are finally waking up to that and there are plenty of research papers out there that you can look up a lot of these details. Um, but again, it begins with the consumer and it begins with our choices because these things wouldn't be made if no one was buying them, right? If we decide to buy things like toys made from recycled materials or things out of recycled paper, these are options that are a little bit more sustainable than choosing something that will literally last forever. Plastic is made to last forever. It's not made to break down. 
that's what makes it such a perfect material for so many things. But now we're at a juncture where we got to be like, okay, is it really worth it? Do we want to see this in our landfill? Um, and, and then also realizing that BIPOC communities are disproportionately impacted negatively because of this entire process from extracting that crude oil all the way to disposing of that plastic trash. We're seeing it around the world impacting communities of color. So how do we make that a, okay, so we hear that and, 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 and we process that and we think, well, that's problematic and we'll just throw that in with all the other problems in the world, but what does that have to do, do with me? Because most people, and if you'll talk on this, most people think, well, I'll just recycle. So, so I'll just keep using my plastic and keep getting plastic and then I'll just, you know, recycle. Can you tell people, um, educate us about what happens in the recycling process and what has to be there in order and then what happens to the bio waste? Well, unfortunately, you know, recycling, the recycling system specifically here in America is, is quite broken. Um, there are lots of, you know, different municipalities that are doing their absolute best to handle the amount of waste coming their way. But it, it is it is just a huge like challenge to figure out how to move that plastic waste. Where does it go? Plus, on top of that, we've got so many different kinds of plastic. You know, if you look at the bottom of a bottle, you'll see there's a little number sign. And what you'll find as you look at products around your house, you'll see that different plastic products have different numbers. And so these different numbers are recycled in different ways. And not every city or county has the ability or the resources to have the machines that can recycle that type of plastic. Um, so we're, we're seeing like massive issues with trying to deal with the amount that's coming in because each of us, if you just assess what you do on a daily basis in your own individual life, look at how much plastic you're, you're, you're interacting with every single day and times that by a billion actually times it by 8 billion people almost. Uh, I mean, it's intense. So what, what can we do? It's about kind of stopping it at the source, close, closing that tap. And the way that you can close it as an individual is to start refusing to buy some of those products, like pulling them out of your lifestyle, choosing something different. And thankfully, we're living in a time where there are so many entrepreneurs out there that are looking into alternatives and figuring out other ways of doing certain things and making products that are beneficial if you know and, and not harmful to the consumer and to other people and the planet so it's about doing homework and figuring out okay i'm using this thing is there an alternative it may take a little more time might take a little more money but if you're able and financially you know um able to buy that thing that could be a better alternative then do it so when you i love that but we're just one individual's or two individuals in a sea of plastic. What can we do in our neighborhoods? What can we do? You know, I'm, I so love um, the fact when I think about Meghan Markle and the letter that she wrote um, to change the world. Um, what can we do as, as young girls and women to, to get off of this live and say, I'm gonna make step one. Do we need to call you know, our state capital? Do we need to call our local representatives? Um, do we go to, I'm in, I'm in the state of Washington, so it is, it is so, it's such a great place if you're, you know, want to get involved in the environment. Um, it, you know, it's an evergreen state. So there's so many campaigns, there's, it's literally like just pick up the phone and, and find out what to do. But what, what, what can we do? Like what's an actionable step that we can take tomorrow for one individual listening to, to, to us tonight? Mm, one individual step. I think the first step is to pick what you're passionate about. Because as you said before, we've got so many different issues out in the world right now that we're dealing with and trying to handle and our own individual challenges. I think it's about deciding that you see something that's not working in the world and not working for the people around you, for yourself, the people that you love. Pick that one thing and go all the way in with it. Like, Call your, like you said, call your legislators about that issue. Um, look locally. I mean, you have to start local. You have to start within the first square mile of where you live. What are the issues facing that particular area? Because that's the closest proximity to you. And so if we act locally and we think globally, that's when we'll see exponential change. And it's hard to just say one thing, to be quite honest. I mean, yeah. there, <laughs> there are a lot of solutions out there. Um, but what gives me the most hope? is this idea that our internal ethos, like our consciousness as individuals, 
I believe is shifting in a direction where we're now seeing the value, obviously, of nature and the support system that we have on this planet and recognizing that humans are a part of that system. We're not separate. We're not above it. We're not fixed out outside of it. We are a part of this system. Yeah. And the more that we recognize that as individuals starting off, the more that you'll be awakened to like other ideas that you can apply in your own life. And then as we continue to work together in collaboration, whether it's with a local organization that you know of that's doing some work, you know, addressing um, pollution, but also addressing hunger. This is also a big issue in our communities where we're seeing this, this connection between people who are, are dealing with hunger insecurity or food insecurity um, because they live in food deserts. Why do they live in food deserts? Well, there's these areas that have been redlined off that are usually these same areas of the places where you're seeing the, the environmental injustice is happening, where there's contaminated water or there's contaminated air. And all these things are intersecting in a way that you can't look, you can't look the other direction. You have to look at it for what it is and how do we make sure that we pour more resources into the communities that need it the most and make sure that the leaders who are part of that community are uplifted in a way that they can you know, point us in the right direction on how to do the work that's needed because it's so nuanced. Every community is different. Um, but I say, you know, it's, it's about uplifting specifically BIPOC leaders.